right. Okay. So I'd like to encourage everyone to uh, please mute your audio. Okay. So before we start <laughs> really quickly, uh, we're just going to give a brief um, intro to what we're doing today and okay. um, talk about ISFHA bits and then we will continue. So we have three speakers for today. I think everyone must have seen that on the flyer. And so, but before we start though, today we're going to be talking about how COVID-19 has affected access to food and healthcare. It is actually quite a problem because right now it's kind of like every other, a lot of things have been forgotten or put on the back burner, even though before now they were really, really important. Um, I will take it over from her because I've moderated a few of these sections before, even though I'm going to be a speaker for today. So um, like she was saying, she um, was explaining that there are other, other things that are affecting her, um, that, are, that, that is affecting everyone all over the world now outside um, COVID-19. So, but a lot of people do not talk about that as often as they talk about COVID-19. So today we want to bring to light those things. And we know like the basic things that humans need is access to food, access to shelter, and access to clothing. Um, and directly or indirectly, this affects um, life, it affects healthcare. So the next um, week, actually, we are going to be talking with architect Lime, thank God he's here. And um, he'll be telling, talking to us about access to housing and shelter. But today we are going to be focusing on access to food. So, um, I mean, we are going to start, we, we have three panelists today. I am one of the panelists and we have Sipasi Olalekan and we also have Edia, Etaka Edia. Etaka is from Cameroon, Sipasi is from the US University of Kansas. And my name is Modesta, I'm from the University of Florida. So we are happy to have you here. At this point, I would love to call upon Etaka. Before then, um, let me invite Etaka to share her screen and start her program. Etaka is an agricultural graduate from the University of Bue in Cameroon. She's the founder of Skills, She Skills, a social venture aimed at building sustainable Africa community by empowering women to be financially independent. When I met, I met Etaka, I mean, I met her recently. I actually, a friend introduced her to me. So, and the first thing that I saw on her profile is that she's a farmer. I'm like, okay, so she's like the best person for this talk because she's had a lot of experiences around food and farming. So she's a Cameroon leadership, um, young, young dynamic purpose driven change maker. And she's a co-founder of The Farmer. She's also passionate about agriculture, women, financial empowerment, and how they can be used to reduce poverty and ensure zero hunger in Africa. She is a member of many organizations working with women and agriculture, both in Cameroon, um, and some groups like African Youth in Agribusiness, Young African Women in Leadership Organizations, and she has over five years working in a lot of community issues. So Etaka, we are happy to have you. Please, you have the floor. Very much. <coughs> So today I'm going to be talking to you guys about food and health in Cameroon amidst um, COVID-19. One thing I want you to first know is that even before now, there was already hunger, like 113 million people uh, in the world were already having hunger crisis before COVID-19. So you can imagine how COVID-19 is going to um, act on it again, like how much hunger and if we don't we don't try to put in some kind of um you know some kind of policies or measures that we ensure that food is available because there was already hunger next slide please okay so covid-19 is threatening um threatening to significantly worsen the, the hunger as i already said like 130 million people in the world are already suffering from hunger. And <clears throat> as governments continue to restrict movement of people because they believe that when we are moving and meeting people, that's how we get to um, move the virus. So they are trying to control our movement. But the more they move, they, they control our movements, is the more they stop agricultural activities. Because most of our, 
other um, things are relating to people, our market, we have to move to go and sell. Today, the very first thing I'll be talking to you guys is on how um, COVID-19 has affected me as a farmer or farmers in general, using myself as an example, please. Next slide. Thank you very much. So the very first thing I'm going to talk about here is the fact that there's a decline in production. You realize that COVID-19 has um, stopped our movement. Transportation, for example, between March, in, in the month of March, our government of Cameroon actually said that we should reduce movements. And so because of this restriction of transportation, they are able to inputs that we use in the farm. And this is a lot on our production because you, we, this is the peak period where we produce in, in Cameroon. This is the beginning of the farming season in Cameroon, March. So when these inputs are delayed and they cannot get to us on time, that's our production has reduced because we need them to work on our farms. We also realize that there's an increase in the price of input. We get our inputs from countries like China, neighboring Nigeria, and other countries like the US. Inputs like fertilizers, like pesticides, and even the seed. You'll be seen in the next slide, I go cucumber, and I do a bit of fish rearing. And we need uh, seeds, improved seeds from the US. We don't have them in Cameroon, and they had blocked the, 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 the borders get to us and when they even get to us the prices are high because of the fact that they have closed the borders and these people that have the old stock available with them that could sell it to us you also see that there's a disruption in the food um, chain because this movement uh, um, the movement controls diminishes the the, the, the the access to market people were afraid to come to the market to buy and because of this we could not be able to sell our crops. So there was this um, disruption in the flow of the food market. You also see that there's reduction in the purchasing power because people are afraid, many of them actually stay in the house, even though they're really hungry and they really want to eat with the problem of being able to sell uh, um, our products to people. The fact that many restaurants, because um, as another control measure, the government of Cameroon actually so restaurants to shut down. So restaurants, bars, hotels, and places where people really meet were shut down for a while. And these are the people, these are our clients. And so because they were not running, we have this um, financial decrease, you know, it has affected us financially. We cannot really sell our products. We cannot go to the markets to sell because people are, um, we, we have transportation okay. issues. Yeah. We cannot go to the hotels to give because the um, hotels are not operating. And, so you realize that we as farmers are suffering a lot during this COVID-19. Can you get Modesta? Okay. So yeah, I just showed you a picture of my farm. Let you see the, 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 the fishes I grow and you know the cucumber. I do a little bit of poultry, a little bit of um, fishery, um, cultivation of mushrooms and you know, something like an integrated system. Next slide. Okay. Now, what can we actually learn from the poor access to food and health in Cameroon? This COVID-19 to us as farmers or as um, people in general should be able to teach us so many things and make us learn lessons to repeat itself again, you know, in case there's another pandemic. The first thing I would like to say here is we preservation. Most of our um, rice in Cameroon is gotten from China. Imagine that we're able to buy rice, for example, in large quantity and always stop in the country. When these borders are closed, like they are closed at the moment, we will not, be able, we will not have these issues that we are having when it comes to hunger and all of that. Another thing we need to think of is alternative medicine. Because the government truly of Cameroon could not even take care of everybody. The truth is, <laughs> I don't know if you guys also have this issue, Modesta, but we in Cameroon have developed all sorts of uh, um, teas, like ginger tea, like um, 
garlic in the tea, lemon, and I feel like those are authentic healthy. The least, I don't know, every morning when once I have a little cold and I'm coughing just a little, my mother gets scared and she prepares fever grass. I don't know if you know what fever grass is, or it's lemon grass in your country, but we prepare these teas and we drink. So they, 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 I'm sure that there are some alternative kinds of medicines that we could take to ensure that people stay healthy because they got the, the, the access to health in Cameroon and in Africa in general is really poor. And if we are going to wait all the time for the government to really take care of us, then it's going to be really challenging. So we have to always think of alternative measures and methods. What are those traditional herbs that, you know, plants are always there, they're always healthy. And so we onto these plants and use them as alternative sources of medicine. Another thing we are proposing is to use sustainable but local food growing methods. Imagine that we in Cameroon could produce our own uh, um, hybrid seeds, you know, improved seeds. We will not have to wait and have this delay when it comes to COVID, um, some other pandemic sometime when they close the borders because we ourselves will be able to grow. What if we had other sustainable ways that uh, we can grow crops locally that we no need to get fertilizers or you know pesticides from abroad? For example, neem plant is a very good pesticide. I don't know if you guys know it in Nigeria, but if we as a country could decide to work on how we can really pull out um, this plants really grow it well and use it in our fields, then we can be sure that uh, Modesta, even in the pandemics in the future, will be able to ensure food for the people and ensure that, uh, um, you know, medicine can get to everybody because the government can really not do it all. If we are going to wait to think that the government will take care of everything, then we are mistaken. We as a community really need to come together to find other measures, other uh, innovative, but local ways of ensuring our food and our health for ourselves. I think if we even have healthy foods, most of the time our immune system will be strong. If you notice in Cameroon, the, the, the number of people affected by COVID is about 2,000 something at the moment, and the number of people who have been cured is 1,000 something. And that's not because the people were cured in the hospitals. It's because of what I said, we drink garlic, we drink um, ginger and the rest. I'm not saying, I'm not a medical doctor, so I cannot confirm to you guys that these things actually cure people. But I feel like there's some other alternative measures we can look at in um, times of crisis like this. Thank you very much. Um, I'm open to any questions you guys have. It's been an honor to really share with you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much, Etaka. I really, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, but you have listed some really solid points in the way forward for better food supply and access to healthcare that is independent of the current governments. And I think that there are ways that we can answer. Well, I'm hoping other people have questions so that at the end of it, you can ask her. So I'm going to introduce Sipasi. Sipasi Olale Khan is a PhD student and a graduate research assistant at Kansas State University, USA, and an active development worker in the space of climate smart agriculture. Sipasi was invited to work under the office of the Vice President of Nigeria on the National Livestock Transformation Plan. He also founded Protect Ozone Sustainable Livelihood Initiative, where he trains children, youths, women, and farmers in climate smart agriculture. Uh, can we, even though our mics are mute, but can we clap for him as he comes up? Wow. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Before you go on Sipasi, okay. I mean, all of us here, all of us here eat food. I'm very sure that we've, maybe we've had breakfast or lunch or dinner. So while Sipasi's presentation is going on, I would like us to comment on the chat section. How has COVID-19 affected, or how do you think it has affected your access, your own immediate access to food, and those of the people that are around you? So Sipasi, please, you have the floor. I have, I have. Tell, tell the person that 
But show your body. Mm-hmm. That that's what a diabetic patient and then the Okay. Hi everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Yes. Good morning. Yeah. Firstly, I would like to appreciate Itaka um Sebon pre- presentation. Um, well done. It's <laughs> a very good job. Um I merci, think, merci. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um I think you actually looked into my presentation and picked some things. So um, I'm Sepase Olale Kwayodele, I'm currently in the US for my PhD in agriculture. And um, today I'll be talking on connecting food insecurity as a public health problem. And um, I'll be actually looking at the public health and COVID-19. You know, I'll be sharing my perspective as a player in the industry. And also I'll be sharing my perspective as a researcher in the industry. And um, of course, I really want to appreciate Modesta for bringing me on board. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, so I would like to start by introducing myself a bit. Um, yeah, what I stand for, I hate to see hunger. I mean, when it comes to extreme hunger and poverty, I hate to see it. And the work I do has been mentioned in my profile. I work with Protector Zone, where we train children, youth, farmers, and active citizens women in sustainable agricultural practices to fight extreme poverty and eating hunger, you know, on our continent of Africa. So basically that is what I do. And of course, I'm from Nigeria, on those states to be precise, you might be wondering where Sipasi is from and where I'm going. Um, my journey is actually very far. You can say I'm using an aeroplane, you know, to get there. Um, probably someday we're gonna become the decision makers in the agricultural table of Nigeria and Africa at large to actually influence decision at the top. And we hope this is gonna trickle down. So probably um, the next minister for agriculture and natural resources in Nigeria was gonna be Sipasi. Is someone saying amen to that? Amen. <laughs> thank you. So, amen. Um, amen. Thank you. So agriculture in my own opinion, agriculture in Africa, this is actually my own personal opinion. I believe in Africa, we are not the owner of technology, but we are the owner of agriculture. However, we can leverage on technology effectively to improve the productivity and production of agriculture in Africa. So we might be talking about poverty in Africa, we might be talking about hunger in Africa, but I think it is an abomination for us to be talking about extreme poverty in Africa. It's an abomination for us to be talking about eating poverty in Africa because we have more than enough land, not just land, we have arable land and water. It's a different thing for you to have land and not water. It's another thing for you to have arable land and water. I think one thing researchers in Africa needs to start doing is to start looking at plant and water relationship and how it affects our food production. We need to evaluate our natural resources in the agricultural sector in order to fight extreme poverty and improve our health as a whole. Um, yeah. So now I actually want to quickly connect the dots. Do you have an idea of how many children, how many children on the continent of Africa in a year that are losing their sight because of a very small vitamin, vitamin A? A lot of children are actually losing their sight because of that. And these children, their future is getting mortgaged just because of a missing nutrient. Do you have an idea of how many pregnant women we are losing on the continent of Africa because of lack of vitamin A and a simple mineral iron. You know, these particular things, minerals and vitamins can actually be gotten through agricultural process, of course, through vegetable. Things as common as vegetable, you know, things as common as, you know, these are things whereby you could actually, these are food, you could actually get your, uh, uh, I mean, these uh, minerals and vitamins from. And just imagine, I studied animal production and health first and second degrees before moving here for another degree entirely in another arm of agriculture. And one thing I know for sure is in animal production, it is actually what we call garbage in and garbage out. So if you are raising a broiler, you have the understanding that the meat conversion ratio or what we call the muzu conversion ratio of a broiler chicken is ratio two to one. That is, if you give two kg of feed to your animal, to your broiler chicken, you are expecting to have about one kg of meat in production. So what we have and what is shaping our future 
is our food. So it depends on how you feed your children. The quality of feed you give to your children is how they are going to produce. So you might be complaining that children are very stubborn in Africa. I think we should go into the agricultural sector to actually see how we are feeding these, um, not animals, these children. You know, it has a direct relation to how they come to be in life to their I mean, intellectual capacity. So food is very important and we can't actually do without food as you may know. So going on from here, so what are the barriers in the new agricultural era? You know, because of the time I have, please, um, you can just send me a chat in the box if I'm going out of my time. <laughs> yeah, I need to know. Or uh, you can help do send me a WhatsApp message or something. So what are the barriers to the new agricultural era? You will agree with me without even going into the history of agriculture in Africa that agriculture has come a very long way in Africa and there's, uh, there's been a lot of um, improvement. So one of the new era problems we have is transhuman. You have people, you have these cattle, uh, I mean, herders moving from one place to another, people just moving across our border without, you know, um, without monitoring them and stuff like that. So let's take a look at grazing, for example. I was fortunate to work with the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development in Abuja, sometimes around 2018, on the National Livestock Transformation Plan and National Homegrown School Feeding Program. So I got to understand from that particular um, work I did with the federal government. Now, these are things you will never see in the media because the media people won't actually go to that length because of their security. I won't blame them. So we have national grazing reserves in our country, Nigeria, that are very effective, very large, and it has the capacity to hold a lot of animals. I mean, a lot of animals. And these things, these reserves are designed using local content initiative. That is what I appreciate most about the design of our national grazing reserves. And it was designed in such a way that they did a dam. They, we have different dams in our national grazing reserves that it collects runoff water. You know, in Africa at large, when it rains, we have a lot of runoff water. So, you know, they connected these dams to the runoff water. That is, after raining, the water goes into the dam. So animals have access to that water throughout the year. So along the line, climate change uh, came in, and um, a lot of people are actually cutting down trees, especially in Nas Nasarawa State, where I worked. Nasarawa, I gone, and some other places, Kayana and some other places in the core north. You know, there's a lot of um, tree felling and what, what have you. So anytime it rains, now instead of taking the water into the dams, so the rainwater washes the topsoil because they don't have canopies any longer, the trees are cut down. So it washes the topsoil into the dam. So the dams become silted. So when the dam becomes silted, the water, the run of water has no place to sit, you know, in the, dam, in, in, I mean, in the dams. So now when the water has no place to sit, it sinks. That means there's no water for animal and there's no water for man. So this actually made the full and cattle rearers, this actually forced them out of the grazing reserves. So, you know, you can do without grass to, I mean, for your animals, but you can never do without water. So it forced them. So it is not just um, the fault of the full and cattle. Of course, I'm not in support, but it's not just their fault. They are forced out of it just because of climate change. And getting out of that, they have to pass through, you know, farms and what have you, then they destroy people's farm. So that is one of the major problems we have in the West African corridor of Africa when it comes to agriculture. The second thing is our border. You know, before now, before now, um, I, I do spend more time in the border of um, Nigeria and Bene Republic, that is Semekoji. You know, sometimes I can spend three hours trying to clear myself in West African corridor, just my neighboring country. But coming to the US, sometimes I spend less than 20 minutes to cross the border. You know, my experience in Europe, just the same. Across Europe, in the Netherlands, in Germany, you know, I get to the border, you know, I just get it, I, I, I mean, I cross the border seamlessly. But in our own local borders, you know, we spend hours upon hours. So imagine if food is coming from one particular country to another, we also spend hours in this particular, um, trying to figure out our border. So that's another problem. And another thing is the insurgency. Of course, we all know about that. Another thing I would like to talk about is insecurity. Insecurity, of course, in the northern part of Nigeria, not only Nigeria, 
Cameroon, Niger, you know, we know where this insecurity is. Um, uh, we know actually where the securities, I mean, where these people are operating, you know, in the West African corridor. You know, when you see that particular thing, and we notice that the northern part of Nigeria is actually the food producing part of the country, the main food production part of the country, and they need agricultural input. Part of the ag agricultural input is urea, and urea is one of the things they use for their explosives. Do you understand? Now, it is very difficult. Government wants to supply fertilizers to the northern part. They want to supply urea, which is one of the fertilizers they use. But the Boko Haram people are also using urea for the explosive. So what do you think the government should do? No, that, that is another problem. That is another barrier in the new agricultural era. So the last thing I would like to talk about in that is our extractives. You know, imagine the price of a barrel drops from $57 to $30 dollars per barrel you know this is just crazy like it is crazy and we need to actually shift our focus from extractive to what we have remember i said what we have is agriculture in africa so i move on now covid19 talking about covid19 covid19 came at a very strategic point in the agricultural sphere of the entire world you know it came at a point when the United States was going out of winter, very cold, and they are going into summer where they will have the opportunity to plant on the field. That means production is not gonna happen. In Nigeria, it's actually happened, or in Africa at large, it's happening when our farmers ought to be preparing for their planting season. And that is very huge. Another thing we need to notice is as, um, as my friend mentioned, the first speaker mentioned earlier on, was the fact that the agri input became a very big issue. For example, imagine people that have harvested their cassavas, you know, waiting for it to be transported during the COVID-19, and the country just went on a lockdown. You know, we, we can never blame our government for locking down the country because they took the right step. You know, I think, I think, and I stand to be corrected that African leaders, especially in Nigeria, they did well in managing COVID-19 better than some Western world. You know, I mean, I agree with that. So now they locked down the entire country or let's say the entire continent due to COVID-19. So people were unable to move their produce. Imagine a farmer that has cassavas uprooted. That means those cassavas are going to get raw thinned on the farm if the farmer has no access to processing facility. And when the, when the government realized that food is very important, you know, they decided to you know, lift the ban on food production, I mean, on, on food transportation. And we discovered that the price of transporting your food, you know, food materials from one place to another, hybrid produce from one place to another, jumped with about 600%. That is alarming. There's no way a farmer is going to survive, you know, with that. And the impact is high. Now, what is the impact of COVID-19? What is the impact going to be like? You know, number one, the impact of COVID-19 is not what we are seeing now. The impact of COVID-19 is going to be in the future because when people cannot produce food now, you know, that means there will not be food in the nearest future. So now the palliative we are still doing is because the uh, COVID-19 is very fresh. So I think there's going to be a very huge economic surge, you know, that is coming. It's actually looming. And we have the economy um, issue about it. Then what we're going to discuss today is about the art, uh, I mean, health aspects. So, you know, um, if you don't have access to good food, your health will automatically be compromised. So now, what is the way out? For me, I think gardening is a way out. It's a huge way out. Home gardening, community gardening, I think this might reduce the burden of the health impact of COVID-19. You know, like this might sound so crazy that, you know, we are talking about food production, we are talking about food sustainability and Sipas is talking about gardening. Let me take you a bit on the journey of home gardening. Um, I need a response. Why is fruit and vegetable so important in our diets? Can someone respond?
minerals and well, it has a lot of the minerals and vitamins that we need to stay healthy right good answer can we have another okay thank you minerals and vitamins are very expensive i mean are very important you know understand i want you guys to understand that i'm a nigerian so if i'm calling vitamins vitamin or if i'm calling vitamin vitamin just understand us cannot change that for me so the vitamins and minerals are very important but there's something we are not paying attention to when it comes to fruit, fruit and vegetables and i wonder why this is not surfacing in our academic system you know across all our academic system in africa and that is what is called um phytochemicals so quickly let's talk about phytochemicals in fruit and vegetables and how it can help us through this unprecedented time in our world so number one what is phytochemical i want you to understand that phytochemicals are not nutrients they are not minerals they are not compound they are not involved in the basic functions of plants but they are bioactives you know they vary from species to species you know and stuff like that and what are the some example that you can actually relate to it is the color of our flowers you know when you see different colors of flowers it's not due to that particular plant it's due to the phytochemical content of the flower so if you are, if you see different shade of fruit red grapes blue these blueberries you know um different shade of apple and everything those colors in your apple fruits different colors is due to the phytochemical content the taste of your food the pepperness or I, I don't know the english to use for that or the hotness of your pepper or the pepperness of your pepper you know has to do with the phytochemical content of it the flavor and the aroma of, of, of our food has to do with phytochemical content so phytochemical is very very essential so it is not an essential nutrient or vitamin but bioactive compound as i said earlier and it does a basic thing to promote the wealth and well-being and also prevent disease promote health and well-being and also prevent disease so these are very important so we have so many phytochemical compounds that are medicinal uh, plant like the first speaker said about covid-19 using our herbs and everything. So the only reason why we have Ado, Ado Jedi and what have you, Agumu in Africa is just because of the phytochemical content that are playing synergetic role, you know, in our body system. And I think that is one thing we have to offer the world. So what are the roles of phytochemical in plants? Of course, in plants, phytochemicals, you know, they have this defense role, you know, um, they, I mean, they have a defense role that is um, they try as much as possible to, pro, uh, to reduce stress of plants, you know, to repel pathogens, you know, they give the color of plants to them. As I said earlier, they help in pollination, dispersal and everything. But what we're talking about is phytochemical content in man. You know, phytochemical actually broadly promote health and well-being, as I mentioned earlier, and prevent or slow down the development of chronic and degenerative disease. Imagine, if you can prevent chronic and degenerative disease through the consumption of phytochemicals, which could be gotten from your vegetables and fruits, that means we should pay attention to the phytochemical content of our food. And today I'm gonna to be taking you through, if time permits me, sorry, I'm checking my time all the time. So if, um, phyto, uh, sorry, if time permits me, I'll be taking you through how we can locally increase the phytochemical content of our fruit and vegetables from our um, gardens, from our backyard gardens. So my advice is this. Um, number one, there should be a complete change of diet in Africa to properly combat the issue of COVID-19. The recommendation we have from the United States is that you have to, for you to be balanced, you have to have, uh, two servings of fruit plus three servings of vegetables on a day. So how do you know? Half cup of a sliced fruit or vegetable, then one cup of fruit. So that is a serving. So that means you have to consume fruits and vegetables in reasonable quantity every day. Then our agricultural training centers should include promotion and increasing phytochemical content of food, including the NGOs, government, private sector, and home gardening should be 
more intentional, should be very more intentional. Uh, Modesta, please don't hesitate to send me a WhatsApp message. I'm really looking at it right now. Um, yeah. So now, it's not just about eating fruit. We have to be intentional about the color of fruit we are eating. I say that again, it's not about eating fruit. We have to be intentional about the color of fruit we eat. Now, different colors of fruit brings in different phytochemicals. So if you are eating your red grapes, I mean, red fruit now, this red color chart, you know, you can get it from all these, um, what's it called, all these fruits and vegetables, um, blue or purple, these, you can get this every morning, I mean, every day. I take grapes, red grapes, because of the re uh, resistroterol. And this has to do with colon cancer. You know, as a man, you know that you are prone to colon cancer and you have to take food that has high resistroterol, which deals with colon cancer. So I have this every morning, every morning, you know, after our meeting, I'm going to have it again. You know, I take it with my heart and everything. So it is very important. You need to understand how this works. If it is white, you know, you can get white, I mean, from white color, you know, you can, uh, this food are responsible for green, you know, this food and for yellow, this food. So let me go to this very quickly. Um, so red colors, any fruit that is red, and there's, there has been a lot of improvement in our tomato production where the lycopene content, lycopene is a phytochemical, where the lycopene content of tomatoes have been increased in order to prevent some degenerative and chronic diseases. So if they're eating any fruit that is red, they consist primarily um, anthocyanin, which is very important, and lycopene. So this can be gotten from tomatoes, watermelon, and red apples. So then if it is red or purple in color, you also have anthocyanin and flavonoids. They can be get, gotten from grapes, which I take every morning, very rich in anthocyanin, um, strawberry and cherries. If it is yellow or orange in color, then we have bitter carotene and flavonoid. If it is blue and purple, we have flavonoid. If it is green or white, you know, from your cabbage, broccoli and cauliflower, you have glucosinolates. It is very important. Um, and, and so tiny, it is very, very important. So these are things you need to understand and shape your food consumption towards it. Then in the white, we have these, um, these stuffs. So now, your health is your color, is the color you eat. It is okay to multicolor. As you are wearing different shades of color in your dressing, also try as much as possible to eat different food. So now, very quickly, as I round up, how do you increase the phytochemical content of your food? Increase the phytochemical content of your home gardens or backyard gardens. It is so simple. For example, if you have um, vegetables planted, um, regardless of the shade of vegetables, you know, if you have vegetables planted, a week to your harvest, all you need to do is to stress, you know, you need to stress the plant. How do you stress the plant? You can stress using, um, you reduce the water you are supplying to the plant. Just reduce the water a bit for, a, I mean, a week. You know, probably you are giving, let's say, like 50 liters of water for the entire garden in a day. Reduce it to about 20 liters in the particular last week. If you could remember, I said, I to, uh, um, phytochemicals um, reduces stress of plants. So when you reduce the water, it will make the stress, it will make the plant, you know, increase its phytochemical production to reduce stress. So once the phytochemical content is reduced, then you can harvest for it. I mean, for eating. After that, you can have, um, I mean, the phytochemical content of that particular fruit and vegetable is going to shoot up, and that's going to be, that's going to improve our health in general. So it is very important to tackle, um, yeah, all this. So thank you guys. I know I've actually short my time. I need to rush, and um, I think I'll be happy to share my slide. And if you need more information, I'll be happy to do so. Feel free to connect me on WhatsApp and you can send me, shoot me. Thank email. you. Yeah. A message. Thank you so much, Sipasi. That was incredibly detailed. And a few people have asked if, if they can get the PDF file. So I think we'll just, you can comment with your phone number and your email. So I guess they can reach out to you.
directly, if that's okay. Yeah, okay. So Spassi yeah. has given us a very detailed analysis of the root of our food problems and a possible way out of it. I'm thinking about it for a while, but yeah. So, all right, so now we're going to move on to Momo, Modesta. Hi, Modesta. Hi. Okay, so Modesta is a host and also a, a was a presenter. All right, so Modesta is a master's student at the Department of Horticultural Sciences in the University of Florida. Before she left us in Nigeria, she works with OFAB Nigeria, an organization that promotes access to innovation for smallholder farmers, where she planned and implemented multiple, multiple outreach programs and um, awareness campaigns on agricultural biotechnology in Nigeria. She was also part of the inaugural cohort of Alliance for Science Global Leadership Fellows Program at Cornell University in 2015. So Momo, you have the stage. Please, nobody else should call her Momo, that's only me. <laughs> Please give her a round of, of applause, thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Adana. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for all those, I mean, who have made comments. I've been reading all the comments because I needed to use that comment in my presentation. And thank you so much, Sipasi and Etaka for your wonderful presentation. I think you set a good stage for me to come in. So the area, the angle that I wanted to approach this is, so first of all, my name is Modesta, like Adana introduced. So part of the work I've been doing for a while now have been around science communication and healthcare advocacy. So the advocacy program I've been doing is alongside the ISMPH, which is a, public, a media and public health society. So um, I wanted to talk about the area of technology. So um, Etaka has given us the perspective as a farmer. Tipasi have given us the angle of nutrition and the angle as a hunger fighter. So there is a role that technology science plays in all of this. And that is what I wanted to talk about today. So um, first of all, I want to share this social distance compliant image of tractors. You see them wearing their face mask and they are equally affected with coronavirus as we are because, I mean, they have to wear their own masks to be safe. I mean, it's a joke, but then there is a global challenge and that challenge is how do we keep the world fed in the midst of this pandemic? So as we see today, all over the world, there is food crisis. Like um, you guys rightly commented, put up on your comments. You said, I, I see some comments saying um, that they could not access food like cassava. Um, I see Saad saying, I've been eating only noodles. Uh, Prince Will said he cannot get fresh food. Uh, Seal Valen said, hidden hunger is real in Nigeria. Adana said, mango, she can't access mangoes. And okay, so there is just a lot of comments about how this coronavirus has affected access to food for everyone. Well, the interesting thing is that it's not just in Nigeria, it's all over the world right now. So uh, the United Nations has estimated that the, the people suffering from acute hunger is going to double, has doubled to 265 million just by the incidence of this coronavirus. And here in the US, it's not different. A lot of people, do not have um, access to food in a lot of ways here in the US. There is actually like the food bank going on. I was actually going to go for the food bank because I mean, we need the food. So, um, well, coming down to Africa, in addition to the coronavirus, which is dominant, there are all a lot of other drivers of food insecurity. We have incidences of conflict, weather extremes, economic shocks, pests, displacements and everything. So if you can see on this map, there is a map here showing the number of people who have been actively affected by this corona uh, pandemic, in addition to all other drivers of food insecurity. So in total, I mean, so far with the data that they have as of April 2020, they see that 73 million people are at risk of um, acute food insecurity in Africa. Well, this is a very big problem and there should be a way around it. So um, going down to examples of what countries have been facing strategically, we see in Ghana, they, I mean, if, you, if you've been following agricultural stories in the past, you, you, you must have heard about the fall army worm. If you know, um, it's, this fall army worm affects the 
our maize, it affects the maize uh, yield seriously. So just within the period of February to April, the four army worm came back to Ghana, it resurfaced and Ghana lost about $64 million. And the four army worm, worm attacked about 50,000 hectares of farm. Farmers are the ones going through these damages, but indirectly it's affecting us the consumers and it's also affecting those who do not have um, a direct access to food. Going back to East Africa, there was this incidence of a uh, locust plague that happened that almost all farms there were devastated by a lot of locusts. So because of that, I mean, that happened a few months ago, but because of the effect that this had had in, in food security, they have relied on importation for, for most of their food um, production. So, but then the coronavirus came, it has re restricted uh, movement, it has restricted access to transportation and everything for so many people. That also is affecting, I mean, they are relying on importation. Now they cannot even import as much as they want because of coronavirus. So that is one way that that has affected access to food. We see that Kenya has been, has, we see a headline that Kenya is set to import about 4 million bags of maize as a country loses its reserve to aflatoxin caused by mold. And this came during this coronavirus period, which is like really strategic. Uganda, a lot of people in Uganda are complaining of poor access to food and they are scared of um, being exposed to infection because they are not eating enough. We also see in Nigeria, this I believe that a lot of us have experienced this. We've had like a lot of hike in food prices because of hindrance to the domestic restrictions and um, import delays. And this has affected farmers in a lot of ways. So, I mean, we've all talked about these problems. What, where do we go from here? What do we do? So there is a need to focus on building a resilient, inclusive farming system. I mean, I, this is a big grammar, I know, but then it simply means like trying to bring all stakeholders together to work, to strategize and develop techniques that work for smallholder farmers in a way that we have storage reserve, in a way that during a global health pandemic, like during this COVID, there will be access to food for everyone. And this resilient food system involves the, the use of all agricultural technologies that can help us produce crops that are climate smart, that are pest resistant, that are disease resistant, that are nutritionally enriched, that are high yielding. So that in the long term, when there is pandemic, when there is any incidents like this, there will be a sustainable and reliable source of food for people in the long term. So in the US, for example, there are lots of technologies. A lot of farmers here are looking into digital farming. And even in the midst of all of the technologies that they have available, it's still not enough to feed people. There is still food insecurity here in the US. So digital farming is the way that they are going. But in Africa, this is actually not the case because we, are, we even have like, our internet is not as stable enough for us to be using Wi-Fi in the farm or for us to be flying drone in the farm using internet and all of that, or for us to be measuring our fertilizer levels using um, computers and everything. So our farming system is not yet as improved as that. However, we have technologies that we, we have access to. And those technologies include a, 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 lot, of, a lot of things that it revolves around policies, that revolves around farm machineries and equipment, that revolves around improving seed quality, in improving the type of seed that we have. So examples of those technology, we have the breeding tools that scientists are using to develop crops, the marker assisted breeding, the ge ge genetic modification technology, gene editing technology, improving agronomic practices like using the uh, correct proportion of fertilizer. Um, also, in addition to that, we need an integration of public and private partnerships and better agricultural policies, which has to do with our leaders and everything. But then there is something that we as individuals can do about this, because when we look at all of this um, scientific procedures here, we think that, okay, so the people that this is a responsibility of maybe scientists or responsibility of the government or the leaders. No, we as consumers can do something about it. And that is why we should start advocating for tools that are within our reach that can be used to improve food. Connecting this food access and technology to healthcare, there is actually an intersection. So now scientists all over the world are looking for alternative options to developing vaccines for all of these um, 
um, all of these um, COVID uh, problems. For example, we have a story about uh, Mexican scientists trying to use develop GMO tomato as an edible vaccine. In this way, you don't have to like places where you don't have health insurance or you don't have good access to healthcare. You could actually buy tomatoes that are already enhanced and can be used as edible vaccine, and that will work and be a good uh, source of de uh, defense against COVID and other infections. We have other examples that they are using tobacco plants in, as a COVID-19 vaccine development tool. So these are all fast growing new improved technology that has a very important role to play in healthcare. We also have, we have uh, scientists are trying to marry molecular farmers and use it to develop a vaccine. All of these are tools and technologies that are going on everywhere, all over the world. So um, this is actually my concluding slide. I want to use this slide to call upon us because in as much as these um, tools are kind of far-fetched, so there is still a long way to go to, for, for us to be able to access this tool. It is important for us to know that as citizens, we have something that we can do about it. And that is talking about it now. Let us start talking about it now. This is not the time where we argue, is this technology better or is this not better? Should we use this or should we not use this? This is not the time actually to worry about the motive behind technology. What matters is that the tool is actually going to play a, a particular role in tr trying to improve access to uh, food security and healthcare. So the time is now for us to start advocating for inclusive technology in agriculture because access to food, you bridge the gap that we have to access healthcare for people all over the world. So um, thank you so much for paying attention to my slide. It's very brief and I, I know, I know there, there were people who requested for, I mean, to make comments. I mean, some people probably chatted me and requested to make comments. So um, I wanted to maybe open up the floor for them before I don't take so to answer, to take up the question for them to make their comments. Um, yeah. Okay, Mo, before you go on, um, I think we should, um, your presentation was amazing. So I think we should give Modesta a round of applause with muted screens and muted, you know, videos and things. Thank you so much. That was great. You're absolutely right. Access to food can bridge the gap in healthcare. Um, I, I think that we should. We can ask questions now. Um, you can either unmute your mic or you could your question in the comments you, it would be great if you can direct it to a particular speaker or it can just be general and someone can answer that but augustine yeah i have a question i know yeah <laughs> seriously i do you know i have a different view because in this platform i see sorry I've been having issues with logging in. I couldn't log in with my laptop or my office because I am in the hospital. They can't assess me. They can't assess my video outside the environment. So I have to use my little phone. Okay. So, yeah, so my comment is I've been in Cameroon. I have so many of my colleagues working in Cameroon. I so much love what Etaka presented, but I have serious issue with Sipasi. Sipasi, I have mm -hmm. to get you directly because you are really on the route I am looking at. There is a comment you made about having a, reserve, a, a grazing reserve in Nigeria. I have, a, I have a problem with that. And when Modesta and you begin to talk about food security in the entire universe, I accept that. But you can't talk about what is happening in the United States with what is happening in Nigeria. You cannot compare the two. What is happening in the United States, you can call it the human for the, the human effect, because wherever humanity is managing stuff, there is always that tendency of selfishness. But what is happening back home in Africa is inhumanity effect. There is no humanity in what we do. If Nigeria has a, gra a grazing reserve that you describe as being huge, and I know that the resources of maintaining this grazing reserve come from the, the common pause, how come? that the yields, the proceeds, are not evenly shared. If I want to buy a gallon of petrol uh, gas in Medugri, it's the same thing with Aba. But if I want to buy 
cow, it is far different in both sides. But my resources is going in both in production of petroleum and in production of uh, cow. So how you worked in government house, thank you, and you're planning to be a minister, which I am praying. Uh, do you have to, how to work on this Senate? Do you for a Nigerian that can be open? Yeah. Thank you so much, um, Father Augustine. I really appreciate your question and stuff like that. Um, I want you to know that um, we're on a public platform, and I, I'm happy to tell you that I have my reasons why I left FMAD. I have my reasons and um, why I left. And truth be told, we need to understand the demography of our country, yeah. Nigeria. We need to understand the demography. In the, I mean, I know about Europe, about, I have friends that are farmer in Europe and um, they told me that the government gives them 70% if they are going into farming, 70% of their cost of production. Do you know the meaning of that? You know, that is, if I need a millionaire to do agriculture, like I can go borrow 3 million and the government will give me 7 million. So that is there. Now, the issue of, the issue around uh, what's it called grazing reserves is another thing. But the innovation about it and how it's been created is a different thing entirely. Now, we have the issue of sesefly, and in the Southwest, we don't do production of, um, we don't do production of beef and stuff like that because it is not our profession. People are not looking into that area. The Northern part of the country has it. So if they have it, you know, how can the government support them to improve their production. Now, I said those um, grazing reserves are very huge, but they are not being utilized. So what I'm trying to say in essence is that, why don't we take all our animals? Now, let me tell you this. I mean, I don't care. I know I'm in a pub public space. Do you know that one of the grazing reserves in Nasarawa State, it, ha it was about, I think the grazing reserve is about 26,000 hectares. One of the one of the influencers in Nigeria, one of the who is who in the Nigerian sector, bought half, more than half of the grazing reserves. And the government is still putting in money, you know, to develop it. That is for the, you know, so these are some pending issues in our country. But the fact is the grazing reserve is there. If we utilize it, they will not have the problem of full and equal to others. I'm not in support of using the I mean, the government fund to get it done 100%, but the government have to support any country that is serious with the agricultural production of Israel country must directly support agriculture. So the, the government is supporting agriculture fine, but I think the grazing itself has to be utilized to minimize the challenges we are having in the country as a whole. Yeah, that was my point. Thank you so much. Just to chip into what you're saying, I'm a Catholic priest. I right. will, this, the truth be told, the, the, this platform are um, serious minded people. And I want us to keep this in record. Tomorrow, if you become a minister, I will remember. I will remind this very thing to you. Something happened when Jonathan was the president. He gave out million, billions to people. The one that came to Abia State, I am standing here to tell you that no farmer got it. It was shared by politicians. So if Nigeria opened up that fight tomorrow, these politicians are holding us to ransom, and the early will begin. The earlier will begin to. Because of the knowledge we've gotten in the Western world, we begin to confront them and do the right things. It will help us. Thank you. Adana, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Father. Thank you very much for your question. Yeah. And I hope we got uh, the, a satisfactory answer. Oh, I do. Um, Chukunon so is raising his hand. I would like to remind us that we have a very limited time. So two minutes at most, please. Thank you. Chukunon so. Okay, um, thank you. Um, like you just said, my name is Chukun Onsu, and uh, actually, I do not want to ask any question. I just wanted to um, say, comment a few things on what uh, Sipasi said, and if I still have uh, more time, I might also add a few, uh, add an addendum. <laughs> What Modesta said earlier. So let me quickly. Uh, can you hear me, please? Yes, yes, we're well with you. Okay. Just like the person said in, in uh, the first time he presented, um, 
about um, giving kudos to leaders uh, for job well done in the containment of the COVID-19. You know, but I want to say a, a few things from healthcare uh, point of view. Actually, uh, the lockdown uh, in some states made it difficult for some to get adequate health care. We have heard uh, unconfirmed tales of people dying on their way to hospital because of because of uh, the difficulty. Like I, uh, there was one uh, they mentioned about um, a politician in Kano State. You know that was like three or four days ago. You know the children were. He was ill, so they rushed him to uh, a private hospital. So when they got there, all the medical doctors there, they ran away because uh, they do not have a PP PPE, and um, you know they were all scared, you know, to give uh, care to a patient. So um, I know that our leaders are doing well, but um, when you check. Uh, they really need to do better, you know. Others can't afford medical bills that is not related to COVID-19, you know, as a result of poor income. Also, due to fear of the pandemic, it has been scary for most people to go to hospital to receive proper treatment, like I said earlier, you know. But just to dive into uh, the healthcare, um, this has shown us that Nigeria has so many medical uh, practitioners. However, these medical practitioners are not very well taken care of. Some are still in the system giving their all. Some can't come and kill themselves as they are not properly rewarded, you know, you know because uh, in terms of hazard allowance, they still give them like 5,000 Naira. Can you believe it, you know? Some before now have diverted to setting up businesses on different parts as there was no job for them in the medical field, you know. So because of this pandemic, it has exposed that we have a, a, a very weak and porous uh, health structure or system, you know, in Africa and in Nigeria uh, to be specific, because this is where I come from. This is, I can just say that. You know, then in terms of um, 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 just to add an addendum to what Modesta said earlier on um, by access to transportation, how it has affected, you know, you know, uh, anything that affects the transport system affects most sectors, especially food and healthcare. As most states or region rely on other states or region for the production of foodstuff, transportation, Tra transporting the food that has been difficult to, you know, due to lack of the uh, 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 easy access to uh, intercity uh, uh, movement, and uh, even when it is possible, one will discover that the transport system becomes gold. The, the transport fare has doubled. Food has also doubled or more in price, you know. Then coupled with the stoppage of work and inadequate profits, the employees you know are not earning or some that are earning are earning way less you know most have lost their job and um, hence affording food has really been difficult you know so um this has like affected uh um most of our families down down there you know so um we really really uh, need to work more you know well this is what i lost my points you know what i wanted more that i wanted to see no, but no. thank you opportunity. thank you very much you can say i think you're absolutely right i mean the pandemic has had a lot of effects on so many different sectors so many different areas it has actually reduced the income of a lot of people some people have gone from being fully employed in one month and the next month not having any source of income so people have you know had their income reduced there's a lot less access to food you're absolutely right um Lua femi falade you have your hand up hello hi hello hi. Good, uh, good morning good afternoon depending on where you are uh, good on everything <laughs> yeah but my name is Oduwa femi falade from nigeria 
and um, I'm a farmer and I'm into agribusiness, MSc and BSc agriculture. <laughs> and I must confess to you guys, I really appreciate this uh, meeting. And I'm not surprised with uh, CPAS's presentation. Uh, it's my brother, I've known him for a while. And also for Modest, uh, I think um, as a co-breeder or geneticist, I understand some of these things you are trying to put through. Um, I think we have tried to look at the problem that, uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we're with you. Yeah, okay. So I think um, we, have, we have tried to look at the problem we are facing because of this COVID um, pandemic in food production. And uh, father, father spoke um, about uh, trans woman that um, Sipasi was talking about. Um, I have just two or three things to add because of my time. The number one thing is that um, when the C person was talking, he spoke about the movement of people for uh, grazing reserves. Sincerely, to, to confess to you, all states have their grazing reserve, but just as C person has said, most of these politicians have even taken them over using government uh, funds to fund their own personal business. And also, some of these um, Fulani guys that were, that were, they were arrested confess that most of these rich men are the ones that own the cattle they are taking around and even some of them are facing problem of rustling you know people attacking them just to steal their car from them just to ensure they get they take advantage of them so i don't think um, we should look at it from the angle of those uh, full and guys themselves i think they have people sponsoring them we may ask question where did they get their ak-47 that they are using to keep people where did they get who is financing them well, maybe that would be a topic for another day. But basically, it's beyond the full name means that we are pointing accusing fingers to. I also look at it, the porosity of our boundary. People from Chad, from Niger, they are bringing their cattle into Nigeria to feed and take them back. So those are the other section of the problem that I think we should also look about and uh, look into. And Modesta was talking about um, genetic improvement as the new way to help agriculture. Yes, I'm a geneticist, I'm a breeder. But I must confess to you, I think you, you have a link with I am the Nigeria Biotechnology Research in Abuja. Am I right, Modesta? Yes, you're right. Okay. And you will agree with me that the present state, the level we are presently, is nothing to write home about when it talks to, comes to doing researches and breeding to produce seedlings for, for Africa or for Nigeria. I know um, we have an um, IIT in um, Ibadan and some other few ones. But the market that is demanding for these seeds is more than what you are producing. This is forcing us to import. Just like you guys said the other time that the effect of this COVID-19 is not really now. It's about the future. Like people are buying seed now. Importation of seed is very, very, very costly nowadays because of COVID um, problem. And even if you look at catfish production and other poultry and livestock production, you will agree with me that even the ingredient that they import to their country now is very costly. Catfish producers are really crying. I spoke to one of them recently, and he was telling me that the price of feed ingredients has increased, and even the market to sell it into is not as available as it used to be. Because normally we see, we know Nigerians, we like um, what we call faji. We like to eat, to enjoy, maybe in the evening. But most people don't do that again. It means that those people that are doing the barbecue, doing pepper soup for them, are not requesting for catfish again. So definitely we have problem of sales still coming up. And people who have um, sunk their money into investing into such businesses will definitely be at the receiving end. Because the problem with livestock is this. If you if you do plant, you can harvest and then um, stop. But for livestock, if you are not killing it, you have to continually spend to ensure you keep the life in there. So that means it's, 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 it's beyond just one phase. Um, having said that, finally, I think there's one thing I think we have not mentioned in this meeting. I have seen businesses springing up based on this COVID season. You may ask me what kind of business. In agric pollution, we are not used to that kind of large-scale uh, processing. But I must confess to you now that I've now been seeing people telling you that they can supply you packaged chicken, packaged fish at your doorstep. It means that the place of logistics is now being taken very serious. Look, we were not prepared for people staying at home and not being able to come to buy from us. But nowadays, people have woke up, woken up to that uh, reality that it is important for you not just to produce, but to also find a way you can bring the feed or bring the produce down to the, to the, to the people who wants to buy. That means that we are now working on the logistics aspect um, as farmers. 
And I believe this COVID has really brought the good out of that one. And I believe it's going to really help us in, in years to come. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Ogofemi. You have made a lot of serious points. Um, I think that we can all agree that Nigerians are innovators. Africans are innovators. A lot of us here are, you know, all have side businesses. We all have something that we're doing. You know, we all have something that we have thought of during this time to earn more money even before now. And I think that we should try to give, you know, Nigeria a lot more credit and Nigerians because, you know, we can't keep saying that Nigeria cannot do so and so while also being the Nigerians that are doing a lot more than you know, our fathers did or our mothers did. So this, okay, that aside, but this has been a very eye-opening, very, very eye-opening session from Etaka, Sipasi, Modesta. We're very, very grateful. I don't know if anybody else has questions. I can't see anybody else's hand up. Does anyone else have any other questions, comments? extras there are some comments on the chat section if you want to take a look at yeah. it yeah okay so um i uh, apart from the people who have had you know food challenges like me and my mangoes um patience abubu says i totally agree with father augustine just like most everything else if nigeria will make any real progress we have to deal with the issue of corruption is deterrent to all of our plans and she is really she's absolutely right if we make all these plans, if we try to, if we think of the way forward and we still have corrupt leaders or even us ourselves being corrupt, we really wouldn't go very far. Um, but Augustine, okay, Modessa says, you make a great point to Laura Femi, we need to step up as a country, especially in the science field. Absolutely, we need a lot more tech, we need a lot more innovations. I mean, we need to accept technology because there's a lot that we are rejecting because we are afraid of but we should be able to innovate more and accept more technology that is safe, obviously. Um, Gloria Baki says, I completely agree with the fact that this pandemic has made people look inwards with a lot more business ideas springing up. Yes, 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 yes. I mean, there's probably more delivery companies now than you have any, as long as you have a bike or you have a car, so a lot of powerful you know, deliveries for things. Um, I hope, I don't know if I covered all the, Comments. Father, yeah. Father. We still have our, yes, we still sir. have we still have time, so we can talk about certain things. We don't have time. We have gone no, past time, but two minutes no. more, please. Okay. Then what I wanted to say is, those living in Nigeria, who are the essential? What are the essential services, and how are they operating? The point you were trying to make about individuals, there is one. Nigeria has the best in the entire world. We can adapt anywhere. We can face any challenges individually. Look at it. Go to any part of the world. Nigerians are leading. But as a system, are we moving to anywhere? No. Just like pushing an I-11 that doesn't have an engine. It can't start. So we actually need to fix the engine so that an I-11 will convert a lot of individuals that are doing marvelously well. Look at a state like River State. You shot people because you were insulted. You said they're going to be locked down for 21 days. This is, you can't get it elsewhere. This is the point I'm trying to make here. Thank you. Okay, Father, okay, just so I, I don't completely agree with you. I do agree that Nigeria does not seem to be going somewhere. But I think that we should really understand the fact that Nigeria is made up of a lot of different components, a lot of industries, a lot of sectors. And really, if you look at it, a lot of people are doing amazingly well. A lot of people are doing really great. And the, the problem is just when we have bad news, all right, that overshadows every progress in every other area. Right, Nigerians, I mean, Sipasi will be a testimony to how Nigerians are making progress within Nigeria and outside of Nigeria. Modesta too. I mean, everybody here, right, is a testament to how far Nigeria can go and how far Nigeria is going. We do have a lot of problems, but I think that the more we acknowledge how well 
a lot of us are doing, a lot, a lot, how well a lot of our sectors are doing, the more progress we'll be able to make in encouraging those people to do more. A lot of people are bad in Nigeria, but a lot of people are good. Father, you're a Nigerian. You're not here, but you're making an impact where you are. No, this, right? you, are, about, you are. You are facing in, individuals. I'm talking about system. Mention a state in Nigeria. System? Mention, mention a state in Nigeria that is working. Make a system. Uh, I won't say Kaduna State. Kaduna State. Oh, can I jump yes. in? Yeah, please, somebody yes, should jump please, in. Please, I'm please, please. Okay. Yeah, you know, um, Father, I think you made a really good and crucial point. Adana, I understand the path from which you are coming from. So let me start with Adana. You know, do you have an idea of how well we are losing the best of the best in Nigeria? Yeah. Oh, everybody is running away. All of you are testament to Nigerians running away. You know, I have wonderful friends that we started doing great stuff together in Nigeria. And, you know, when I speak with them now, the story is different, you know. And also, the fact that Nigeria will not work, I will not totally agree with that. Sure. Because um, we need us to get Nigeria working. And one of the things we are doing is, you know, having conversations like this and we can hold people responsible. You know, like now we've identified some people as who is who in the educational sector, in the agricultural sector and everything. For example, imagine someone like Modesta being, becoming the minister of agriculture or the commissioner. Even one of commissioner, them. good. So let, let me tell you, that means that Father Augustine, you can hold Modesta responsible. Good. We have this recording everywhere. We can hold our, we can hold people responsible. It might take time, but I think we're going to get there. But I'm just afraid that we are losing a lot of our people, and the plan to return is very slim. I'm coming to Nigeria next year. I can't wait anyway. Thank you. I'll, I'll oh, be my with you. Oh wow! Yes, I'm <laughs> Oh my God! <laughs> So Chris, I have a question for Etakat. Um, and yeah. Patience, Patience has a point that she wants to make, and Father yeah. is raising up his hand. So can, let me ask okay, my so, okay. uh, Etakat, please. I mean, I want to get the perspective of you as an individual and as a farmer. How are you managing to keep your fishes alive? And, and are you still able to make sales? Is she still here? Yes, yes I'm here. Come. OK. Yeah. Um, it's been quite expensive. It's been quite expensive, but we are managing. It's, we, we, we get to go to neighboring towns with the transport um, issues, but we get to get the, the seeds there. So we, we, we are managing. With the fishes, is okay. It's the poultry part that feels so bad because we had to feed the, the, the fowls for an additional month just to keep yeah. them alive yeah. since we do not have a market. And that's that's wasted. That's 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 um, additional capital we're putting in that we'll not be able to get back. You know, so it's a waste. But for the fishes, they are okay. fine. You know, <laughs> it's 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 just the fact that they are, um, the feed is a one year process, so it's okay as compared are to you, the fowls that we pass. You know? Are you still able to get like enough food for the fishes, even though you're feeding them past their maturity, but? Do you still have access to their food? Yes, I have. That's what I'm saying. We have access to their food. It's just that it's expensive okay. at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because we don't okay. really have too many fish farmers here. So that one is not a problem. It's poultry and cob that has more challenges. Okay. okay. Um, um, I'd like to address... Um, thank you so much, Ataka. Okay. I'd like to... Um, um, read patient's point, and she made a comment. She says, the system is not just individuals. Processes are also part of the system. The processes don't allow the great people to work. And that is a very solid point. She's absolutely right. I have, I have nothing contrary to that, I, nothing to say. I would, like to, I would like to add something to that. You know, the Nigerian okay. system, the Nigerian system is really where the issues are. I agree um, with Adana when she when she says that um, 
Nigerians have great people. I mean, great people doing things all over the world. And even in this nation, I mean, you go to a state like a Boni state and you see the, the way the governor is um, trying to make things work in that place, in education, in agriculture. It's wonderful. But then that is not the normal. That is not the status quo. You see, you find what we see is a, a process that will not allow people to work. So you have people with good ideas. I mean, a very good example, you all have heard about what they call I am. You know, the, the, the Igbo people call it I am, Imam Madu. It just means who you know. Yeah. It's only when you know someone that you can get a job in a place like, you know, it's only when you know somebody. So, and that is why the, when we are discussing about food security, improving our healthcare, you know, making the night, making Nigeria work, we, we, we should inculcate into that the, the, the politics of the, you know, the game of politics. Because like I said, it's going to be the friction that will slow down or even stop and even negate all the great plans that we talk about. So, like I've been asking some people here, is there a way we can get, you know, these um, lawmakers, executives, is there a way we can get them into a platform like this, into a forum like this? Because if they get to understand that it's not even about the money they are putting in their bank account, there is a relationship between getting people to eat food and the availability of health care. But when it gets to health, it's everybody's business. It doesn't matter that like, you live in a golden mansion. It's your business too. Like this, this COVID-19 has proven that to us, okay? So if they can understand the impact that it, it will have on the healthcare of the people in Nigeria, I think they'll be able to do better. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patience. You're, I, I think that that is something that we should work towards. We're gonna start trying to get more, trying to get lawmakers here. Please, we appreciate your connects. You know, if you know people, as she said, I am, would like to get them to talk about, you know, their work and how their lives affect other Nigerians as politicians. Um, uh, somebody raised, John Atta has his hand up. Guys, we have, okay, <laughs> we don't have a lot of time, but please try to reduce your time. With me, please. Thank you. Oh, okay, thank Hi, you very much. Yeah, hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is John Atta. Yeah, um, thank you very much for um, this platform. Um, just to comment, following up from where um, I think it's patience, also the last speaker, she spoke about the processes. I think it's very key for us to have um, strong political institutions because um, a, a lot of time you see that so many things that happen in this country, people get away with it, both the business, oh. the politicians and, and everybody. If, if, if you followed closely, I think that was last year, last two years, you could see the saga with um, um, the Facebook owner where he went before the Senate and they kept drilling him. Yeah. Um, in such cases in Nigeria, nobody asks questions. It's swept under the carpet. Um, I, I think someone brought up the issue of um, finance, of, of them distributing money, and then it's the political farmers that have access to these loans and all. Yeah, such things happen. You have different regimes coming up with different schemes and billions of naira have been um, distributed and then at the end it's still the same thing so i think we need these strong institutions in nigeria also to follow up on that because i think um finance is really key in taking nigeria's agriculture to the next level if you look at other western societies just like um Sipasi rightly said you see um, very competitive loans from different banks at um single digit rates and it's not it's not political if you work there you have access if you have your, your business plan and everything rightly spelled out. You, you have access to these things. So I think corruption is endemic here and we need to go back to the drawing board and look at it. How, how do we get that out of the way? How do we take, okay, yes, we, there's a, just like um, um, Abu, Abu Du, sorry, I, I, don't, I didn't really get the son name. She spoke mm -hmm. about technologies, agricultural technologies. Yes, we need technologies, but it doesn't come cheap. It doesn't come free. We need to finance. If you look at the biggest bank in the world today, it's an agricultural bank, the China Agricultural Bank. It's the biggest in the world. And it shows you that for you to take agriculture serious, we need that financial investment. We need that financial commitment to move agriculture. And we have, we have so much potential. We have the resources. We have everything in place. And I think 
with I'm, I'm really impressed seeing the, the caliber of people on this platform and i'll be happy actually so pastor said he's coming back um next year by god's grace oh yeah i waiting. hope um our other speakers father please we need you in nigeria we have father Zwamajo. major i met him in 2012 in um, Benin republic he's doing wonderful he's doing great oh, and yes. please we need people yeah. like you please bring such um innovative ideas and everything we need mentorship we need everybody all hands on when the I come back to nigeria to make nigeria yes yeah, so uh, please come secure. back to nigeria yeah. so, um, thank you very much everybody hi john thank you thank you so much for your point thank you actually you're right there's finance is really key sipasi wants to make a short point a short point yeah so you, go on how do you know that short. my point <laughs> it's short. I know it in my spirit. I know. So, um, very quickly, I think agriculture has to go out of the hands of those big fishes. For sure. And we need to strengthen local productions. Local production is contributing more than the big fishes into the agricultural system. So, it, I mean, when we talk about agriculture, governments must, it is a must for government to support agriculture to fight extreme poverty and eating hunger on our continent. Go to big places across the world, you see young people going into agriculture and the government is supporting them to go into it. Because the truth is, don't let us deceive ourselves. Agriculture is not fancy. Agriculture is tedious. And the government of developed nations, they understand that agriculture, uh, agriculture is tedious and there's a lot of packages for farmers, especially young people intended to go into agribusiness. So I'm of the strong of opinion. I mean, if I have the opportunity to get to the place of power today, one of my strengths and my point is going to be supporting youth in the grassroots. Let me tell you, the oil sector and other industry cannot employ the number of youth we have in Africa, but agriculture can employ twice the, I mean, three times the number of what the oil sector is going to employ. So let us strengthen yeah. this particular aspect, and I think, um, yeah, we're going to get there. So thank you, everyone. I need to All go right, now. thank and you. Then, and say, pass it before thank you, you go. Sorry, Abana. Okay, so, no, 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 Father, please, Father. Father, <laughs> chat him privately. Send him a message. We have two more people. <laughs> two more people at the so close, Father, I know. Uh -uh. I will have a Skype call with three of you. I'll meet you now and privately. Thank you very much. Um, Silverlin and Jock will go next, and then Ulua Femi Father, please, I'm begging you. No. <laughs> Silverlin is next. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Good yes. afternoon. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you for the lectures. I truly appreciate. I'm a nutritionist, so I really enjoyed all the process and I learned a lot from simplicity section, especially when it comes to the process of food production in order to add nutrients to our body. But there's a point that we're making here like this seminar is very good, but the truth about it, I've come to understand that most people that teach us are not involved in grassroots. Like, in as much we do this webinar, yeah, so you speak from the point of agriculture and you're doing your PhD. The truth about that, at least you guys should get involved. Like Reverend Father said, it is not about your good, but you have to be in the process. In as much that Nigeria is a corrupt system. It doesn't still stop us from participating in the process. And the problem I've seen with a lot of you is that most of us don't get involved in the process. You see somebody that is very educated, has all the knowledge, but he has not gone to the grassroots to teach people. And that is the problem. Because you should that if we can get the grassroots, they are the ones that even really need this education. Like, there's a problem in Nigeria. If you notice that our mortality rate is very, very low, that in this COVID-19, people say people that are older, die faster in nigeria people are not dying more because the truth about it that the nigeria doesn't really have an as an aging population and this is alarming it has to do with the kind of food we eat and when the surpassing was really teaching i came to notice that our food process is wrong as in because you as in the food production if you check even our ginger and garlic if you go back to the lab the nutrient quality of this food uh, 
actually hiding uh, food. Please, in as much as we are discussing food processes, we need to discuss something that is nutritionally beneficial to the population of Nigeria. And the truth about it is that Nigeria doesn't have an aging population owing to our agricultural processes. And I want people that are experts in this field to address it because how can you live in a nation to see someone that is 80 years is very, very hard, especially in Eastern and Southern Nigeria. So please, this as in my main comment, Concerning, as this is just my point that I want to make. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Silverlin. Uh, Sipasi will respond to you. Then Oluwafemi will ask his question and then we'll take a final comment from Father Augustine. Thank you. Okay, Sipasi, please. Thank you so much for your question and observation that, you know, especially some of us that are holding webinars, you know, we don't get involved in the grassroots, we need to get involved and stuff like that. That is very impressive. Just because of what you mentioned, um, sorry, I would like to share my screen and scroll down something. Just because of what, what you mentioned, I rejected a lot of webinar webinars. You know, I was invited to so many, and I looked at the people on the panel. I discovered that these people are wonderful speakers, but they are not doers. So I just want to show you one of our projects that we did. This is the report of the project funded by the German consulate. And this has been funded severally by the U.S. consulate, by the World Connect in the United States of America and stuff like that. These are grassroots projects in our local communities, teaching people how to construct local content water irrigation kits, you know, that does not waste water. It's called 50% water saving irrigation kit. We teach us home. This is a backyard farm where we are producing about 300 brella chicken from a backyard in Lagos State. This is Lagos State. You are looking at Lagos State. This is one of our projects, Green Faculty. So we do in-class training. We do on-field training. These are, um, these are backyard farms. You can see the broiler from dayhood you know, to maturity. We did a lot about vegetable gardening. This is in Lagos State, the city of Lagos. And we, use, we reuse waste materials from the environment to go food. These are vegetables. These are what we do. You can see this is a way to shock or your cut off. You know, these are things we do. You know, this happens in Lagos. So I think Sipas is not one of those that speaks, but they do. Now, this is our chicken processing and stuff like that. You know, I think these are projects that I personally I do, and I've been doing it for over five years before coming here. And um, the project is still going on in Nigeria. So um, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Thank you very much. So, um, Sipasi has proved to us that he's a grassroots mobilizer. I, I still have something to prove, although I don't have my pictures yet. But no, I just want to say, <laughs> I just want to say, Silverlin, thank you for that comment. I've also, we've also had like a lot, like I don't have mentioned during the introduction, we had a lot of advocacy work that we've done at the grassroots. So, we've actually been involved in the grassroots and you're right you should do more but thank you for that comment yeah so i think the the point is every speaker that we have here today has worked from the grassroots up they are not you know sitting in their office somewhere they are all farmers they all they have their own farms or they've done their own outreach so um they are speaking from a place of experience so um Olua Femi, can you please ask your question sorry for keeping you so long no problem. I, I've been enjoying the discussion too. Um, I spoke the other time, but one thing I just want to add to it and appeal to this house, to this gathering, is um, that um, we, from what Reverend has said, I think we are not going somewhere. But I, I, I know that we are going somewhere. But the only issue I think we have seen is that we are not going for coping the displacement. You know, this is also uh, distance and displacement. So. We are covering distance, but not a uh, specific displacement. Because I work with some you, you see project DFID project, and I can relate that um, some of these intervention programs are even getting to the farmers than government so-called projects that are not really getting to the grassroots. So I want to appeal to all that we don't just form this gathering or we don't just have this meeting and go back to where we are coming from. If we can form a formidable team that can start to work. And when more people into our circles, I don't know what the group will be called. I want to, if there's a platform that uh, did this, there's a way everybody can still come together under that umbrella, wherever we are. Like someone like me, I'm in Bini. I work with projects with, like PIN, that's a partnership for development in Nigeria Delta, and so many other projects like that. I believe we can all bring our own ideas and hegemonize them to 
bring you about just like our booking that models that I spoke about. We can advocate, we can encourage, we can inform, and we can bring about a better farming culture in the country. That is my own plan. I want to give beyond that was speaking beyond our gathering. We can have a write up after this meeting and share it with so whoever is interested on how we think we can go ahead so that we don't just make this meeting one of those common meetings or that people are doing because they are less less busy or something. Thank you very much. So I also saw it. Thank you so much, Femi. Um, you're right. We need to talk less and do more. So we'll see where we can go from there after the meeting. Father, your last. Thank you. I, I am rushing for this. It, to be candid with you, I uh, as a priest, I have this uh, um, back mind issue that whenever I go to preach, if it doesn't summon, I have not done a work. My homily must always be summoning you into action. And uh, what, what we've come here today is not a, a get together. If we've come to celebrate, I won't make us to think. And that is why I, I am now falling in love with C. Valin, uh, Olua Femi, and my greatest enemy in this platform today is Sipasi because I'm actually going to dig into his records. I've been, I'm, I'm searching on him to see what things he has done. He, she has, um, Sivalin have asked us to be doers. This is wonderful. This is excellent. I love Nigeria. This is why I participate in it. I am, if I, I am just, if you call, mention Nigeria, it erupts in my blood. And I tell people everywhere, like this lockdown, I know what I have done to my community, not as a person, but to bring the who is who in my community together to tell them that it is our responsibility to pay back to our community. And this is all we do. But my challenge and my challenge continue to be, let us open up our system that we accommodate this. My final statement on this is, I have a brother, he is in National Hospital, Abuja. He studied medicine in Australia. So when we were having issues with India, how people are striving in India, he told me while he was in school, Indian guys in his class. But anything you want to, they'll give you access to establish it in India and you make returns to it. And this is how the, 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 the medical tourism started in India. So if we have leaders that will actually help us, I mean, the people we have outside would, I'm not glad coming to United States. I would have left Nigeria, Nigeria a year after my ordination, but I was never interested until frustration came to my face. I man, you have to leave. And I got to United States. I cried for a whole month. I was thinking I'm coming to see a country that doesn't have sun, a country that doesn't have grasses. But I came and saw that there is no difference between United States and Nigeria. The only difference is the people living in it. The system, the process is the only system. If you fix Nigeria tomorrow, Nigeria is gonna beat the whole world. We don't have any natural disaster. United States, I live in Florida. In the next few months, we'll start talking about hurricane. And when it comes, you will see everything will go down. They will rebuild again. Some places where you have, uh, you have, you have snow, they, they recoat their, their roads every six months. In Nigeria, just do the major roads once in four or five years. They are not ready to do it. And we have the resources. So the, the, the platform, as Olua Femi have said, as Sipasi have said, as Sivalin have said, and everyone that have spoken have said is for us to think way forward. Let us stop painting these things. Let us stop painting that we are doing well. We are not doing well. Individually, we are doing well, but we cannot go anywhere individually unless we we'll fix the engine. The day we we'll fix the engine, you will see how marvelously, if we begin to reward people through their records, you don't need to do a lesson to have a president. You don't need to do a lesson to have a governor. I listened to the interview granted to, uh, 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 what's this guy's name? They, they brought the younger brother to Anthony Anihara. Go and listen to that interview. You will, your minds will open. There are, we have wonderful people in the country that can fix Nigeria. We don't need to import them. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Father. Thank you for your contribution. Thank you to everyone who has spoken. I'd like to just read out one last comment. Um, Techno Common Proso, sorry, I don't know your name. Um, public health concerns, concern issues raised are very, I think you meant to say very important, but need, or serious, but need to be harnessed and taken seriously. And we I absolutely agree with you. I think that one of the action points from our little angle of action would be, would start a thread just somewhere, um, we're going to start a thread on Twitter and we'd like everyone here to comment, right? This has been about um, how has COVID-19, you know, affected our access to food and our access to healthcare. And a lot of us have raised many action points. And I think that it's something that a lot more people even outside here can take up. So I'd like us to, our Twitter handle is ISMPH, NG. We're going to start a thread on what more we can do to improve our country's access to healthcare, to food, and to better, you know, repair our engine, as Father said. So I would like to encourage everyone here to go to ISMPHNG on Twitter, and you're going to see the tweet there, and you can just reply under the thread, and hopefully that is a step in the right direction. And we have come to the end. Modesta is going to give us our closing comments. Um, I mean, thank you, everyone. It was, uh, you should just start for us and close her. that. That's it. <laughs> thank you, okay, everyone. Thanks. Let's keep this conversation going. <laughs> oh, sure. Yes, please. Let us keep it going. I, I really am looking forward to everybody here commenting on that, sharing more messages that we put out because every day what we are trying to do in ISMPH is improve access to information improve i mean once everyone if people are able to get a lot more information you're able to take a lot you're able to take informed action okay i think adas network is freezing again so at this juncture i want to say thank you again to everyone so i guess we'll see all of you on twitter have a good day and bye nigeria thank you so much Bye. <laughs> uh, bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.